a journey with Joe into Diabetes. Uh, di- excuse me? Die what? Diabetes. It's diabetes. 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 That's an awfully big word that many people, even some adults, don't fully understand. But we've realized we have got to start paying attention to diabetes because it's an epidemic. Epidemic means a lot of people are developing diabetes and we're having a hard time stopping it. Now you might be thinking, I'm just a kid. Why do I need to know this stuff? Well, this epidemic is affecting children as well as adults. In fact, one out of three Americans born around the year 2000 is expected to develop diabetes in their lifetime unless something is done to stop it. Which means two out of every six kids or 100 out of every 300 kids. So we're going to give you just a few easy tips on how you can lower your risk of being that one out of three who develop diabetes. Okay, why don't we introduce ourselves? And then we'll bring out our special guest. I'm Sarah. Oh, hey, I'm Nathaniel. I'm Nurse Debbie, and this is Joe! <laughs> oh, don't you worry. Joe has some amazing secrets to reveal to you. Just you wait. All right, Joe, that's enough. Now, let's start by talking about what diabetes is. Diabetes mellitus is when a person has trouble making or using something called insulin. insulin. And they end up with high levels of glucose or sugar in their blood. The two main types of diabetes are type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is when the body has trouble making insulin. Type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes usually begins when the body has trouble using insulin, but making insulin could also be a problem in type 2 diabetes. Over 90% of people with diabetes have type 2. So we're going to be focusing on type 2 diabetes. Now insulin comes from an organ called the pancreas. When I talk about insulin, I want you to think of it as a very special key with a very important job. When glucose or sugar rises in your bloodstream, insulin binds to the cells in your body to unlock special pathways that allows glucose to enter your cells. And this is a good thing because your cells use glucose as energy or fuel to help you move your body and do all the wonderful things you do during the day like walking and going upstairs, riding your bicycle and, and helping your mom and dad clean the house. <laughs> The glucose you don't use is stored, so it can be used later. Where does glucose come from? A big source is from a certain type of food we eat called... Carbohydrates. Or carbs. Now, there are five main types of foods that are considered carbs. Milk and yogurt. Starches and grains. Starchy vegetables. Fruits. And sweets. All of these types of foods become glucose in your blood, not just candy. It's not only important for you to know which foods become glucose in your blood, 
but also to know how much of these foods is considered a serving. 15 grams of carbohydrates is considered one carb serving. My dietitian says that I should have about three carb servings per meal. How many carb servings each person needs depends on many different things, such as your age, your size, whether you're a boy or a girl, how active you are, your health, and so on. So, talk to your doctor to find out about how much you should be eating. Now, let's dig a little deeper into each type of food. I tell you, Joe, all this hard work makes me wish I would have finished my vegetables instead of going to bed hungry. The first carbohydrate is simple. Milk and yogurt. This one cup of milk is considered one carb serving. The second is starches and grains. This is a big group that includes things like bread, bagels, breadsticks, pizza crust, crackers, pasta, beans, rice, cereal, and flour, just to name a few. One piece of bread is considered one carb serving. Three tablespoons of flour is one carb serving. So those breaded items that we eat are usually coated with carbs. The third type is starchy vegetables. Which includes peas, potatoes, and corn. Only about 10 french fries is considered one carb serving. So be careful about how many you're eating. And did you ever think that peas would become sugar in your blood? Well, they do. The fourth type is fruit. This includes apples, bananas, oranges, peaches, strawberries, and fruit juice. <laughs> one small apple is considered one carb serving. A great thing about eating fresh fruits and vegetables is that they're usually packed with vitamins and minerals and a wonderful secret ingredient called fiber. The peeling of this apple is rich with fiber. So eat your peelings. High fiber foods slow our digestion. So that glucose reaches our bloodstream more slowly. And the fiber makes you feel full, so you're not likely to eat as much. Now juice is in this category, and it's a healthy choice, but it usually doesn't have as much fiber as whole fruit. And only about a half a cup is considered a carb serving. That's not much. So if I were to drink this glass of juice, I just drank two meals worth of carbs. So be careful not to be drinking too many carbs. And the last type is sweets. Like candy, pop, cake, cookies, donuts, and pie. Sweets are supposed to be used sparingly, which means not that often, because they tend to be rich in calories instead of nutrients. By eating a lot of sweets, you are missing out on a lot of the very important vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that our bodies need to be healthy. Only a one inch piece of frosted cake is considered a carb serving. Just think about how many carbs you're eating when you eat a piece of cake this big. Let's talk for a minute about soft drinks. This 24 ounce regular soft drink has almost two meals worth of carbs in it for me. And soft drinks don't offer all the vitamins, minerals, and fiber that a healthy meal does. If I were to go out to lunch, eat my meal, and have this soft drink with my meal, I just consume nearly three meals worth of carbs. Do I need three meals worth of carbs at lunchtime? No way! In fact, Sarah's been doing an experiment and has drank just one 24 ounce soft drink a day for one year. And she's found that by doing that, she's consumed up to 70 pounds of sugary products. So be careful about how many carbs you're drinking. 
Now, I'm not saying that you should never have sweets or soft drinks, but these are sometimes treats for special occasions. There are only three types of foods that are not considered carbohydrates, which means they don't have a significant effect on your blood glucose as long as you don't overeat them. They are fats and oils, proteins, and non-starchy vegetables. Fats and oils are like butter, oil, sour cream, and mayonnaise. Now fats, like sweets, tend to be calorie rich instead of nutrient rich. By eating too many fatty foods, you're missing out on a lot of the very important nutrients that your body needs to grow and have energy. Examples of proteins would be steak, tuna, eggs, turkey, and chicken. Beans are another food with a lot of protein, but they are also a carb, so remember to treat them like a starch. And non-starchy vegetables include foods like lettuce, celery, carrots, green peppers, and asparagus. Ooh, yuck! Some of the items we've listed do have a few carbs in them, but not enough to be put in the carbohydrate group. They're all considered carb-free, as long as we don't overeat them. You're eating well. See what good eating habits can do for you. More non-starchy vegetables, son? <laughs> That's our Timmy. It's lunchtime, and I think Joe's getting hungry. Can Joe eat lunch with you two? Yes. Sure. Can you guys tell me which foods on your plate are considered carbohydrates? The mashed potatoes are a carb. And the applesauce is a carb too. It's a fruit. Well, the green beans are not a carb. That's right. The green beans are from the non-starchy vegetable group, so they're not considered a carbohydrate. But there's still a few more. Well, it's not the chicken, because that's a protein. But what's the chicken rolled in? Flour. Yep. Flour is a carb from the starches and grains group. But anything else? What about the milk? Isn't it a carb? That's right. The milk's a carb too. There's one last item, and it's kind of a tricky one. The gravy does have some carbohydrates in it because it was made with flour. Now let's talk about type 2 diabetes. <coughs> Joe, are you ready for your big roll? Prepare to launch type 2 diabetes. On three. Here we go. One, two, three. So, did anything happen? Yeah, that's how type 2 diabetes works. You really can't see anything happening on the outside. And it doesn't happen instantly. In the beginning of type 2 diabetes, everything seems to be working okay. Joe eats his chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy, applesauce, and milk, and it enters his bloodstream as glucose, and Joe releases insulin to move the glucose into the cells. No problem. But let's say today, Joe doesn't feel like doing much to use up the glucose or fuel that he's eaten. When he gets home, he wants to try to beat the next level on his cyborg samurai hamsters from space video game. And Joe knows his mom has some gummy snacks in the kitchen, and so he gets some gummy snacks, grabs a soft drink, and he gets ready for an evening of button pushing and snacking. Now, are there carbs and gummy snacks and soft drinks? You bet. Are his cells hungry? No! Has he used up the fuel that he ate for lunch? No! His glucose is stored, waiting to be used. But instead of using up the glucose, Joe adds more glucose from the candy and soft drink. Joe's body sends messages to his pancreas to release more insulin. And Joe's pancreas releases more insulin, and the insulin helps move the glucose into the cell. Now it's supper time. Joe eats some spaghetti and cheesy bread and some milk. So here comes more glucose. Are his cells hungry? Of course not. But messages go to Joe's pancreas to release more insulin. 
Now Joe's little pancreas might be getting tired, but it still sends even more insulin. The insulin tries to bind to the cell wall, but this time, some of Joe's cells say, you know what, I've had enough. I don't want any more glucose. Pick me, pick me, When this pick happens, me. insulin pick can me. have trouble either binding to the cell wall or have trouble doing its job inside the cell. If insulin can't do its job, then glucose can't enter the cell and it starts to build up in the bloodstream. More messages are sent to Joe's pancreas saying, Hey, we still got a lot of glucose out here in the blood. Send more insulin. More? And Joe's pancreas says, I just sent you more insulin. But okay, here's more insulin. Now Joe not only has higher than normal levels of sugar in his blood, but he also has higher than normal levels of insulin in his blood too. This is called insulin resistance, which can be the beginning of type 2 diabetes. This usually doesn't happen by eating too much or not exercising enough for just a day or two, but if we make it a habit to consistently eat more than what we're using or not exercise enough every day, then it could become a problem. And this is hard on Joe's pancreas. Over time, if we don't work to correct this, your pancreas can start to wear out. When this happens, the glucose levels get even higher. Here we come. This is not a healthy state for Joe's blood to be in. When the glucose in Joe's blood is normal, his blood flows freely through his blood vessels and arteries, being pumped throughout his body doing all the wonderful jobs that blood has. But when Joe's blood gets high levels of glucose in it, it gets very thick and sticky and sweet. I call it sludge blood. As sludge blood pumps through Joe's body, it damages Joe's vessel walls, irritating them, inflaming them, nicking them, and causing clots. And if this goes on for too long, this can block the blood flow in Joe's body, causing damage. In fact, diabetes is the number one cause of new blindness, end-stage kidney failure, and non-traumatic amputations in America. An amputation is when you have to have part of your body, like your feet or your legs, cut off. People with diabetes also have a higher risk of having heart disease or stroke. Now these things don't have to happen. If you or someone you love has diabetes, work closely with your doctor to keep your blood sugars normal. Some of the reasons insulin resistance can happen might be from consistently eating more than we use, gaining too much weight, not exercising enough, genetics, or being in certain ethnic groups. If someone has insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, it doesn't necessarily mean they've done anything wrong, but it does mean they might be able to do a few things to help out their body. So we need to help Joe, don't we? Yes! What could Joe do to make his cells hungry again? Exercise. That's right, and maybe not eat more than he's using. What does it feel like to have type 2 diabetes? Unfortunately, the signs of type 2 diabetes are sometimes hard to notice. A person might feel more tired than usual because the glucose they're eating is staying in the bloodstream and not entering the cells. A person might also notice that they're urinating or peeing more often. This is because when the glucose builds up inside of you, your body wants to get rid of it. And it can send some of it into your urine. And when the glucose builds up in your urine, it binds with the water in your body and pulls out extra fluid out of your body. In fact, this is how diabetes got its name. The word diabetes means to pass water like a siphon. Years ago, doctors noticed that people who had this condition urinated a lot. 
That's because when your glucose levels are high, glucose can build up in your urine, and when you urinate out a lot of glucose, this pulls water out of your body. Now this type of diabetes is called diabetes mellitus. The word mellitus means honey. Doctors also noticed that ants and bugs were attracted to this urine. They realized it was because the urine tasted sweet, like honey. It was full of sugar. If you're urinating out your extra fluid, then a person might notice that they're thirstier than normal. So thirst is another symptom of type 2 diabetes. Hunger and weight loss can also be symptoms of type 2 diabetes. This is because you're not moving the food you're eating into your cells. Instead, remember that you're urinating out some of it, which leaves you feeling hungry and possibly causes you to lose some weight. Irritability might be another symptom. This is when you feel kind of cranky. Blurry vision can also be a symptom. And some people with diabetes can have darkened areas of skin in the creases of their body, like on their neck and in their armpits. But the biggest symptom is that there may be no symptoms. This is because a person's glucose usually rises very slowly with type 2 diabetes because your little pancreas works so hard in the beginning making extra insulin. This way, everybody, over here. In fact, your body does such a great job of trying to correct this situation that a person can walk around with the glucose rising in their bloodstream for years before it gets high enough to diagnose diabetes. A person might have normal blood sugar levels for a while, and then their blood sugar might go up just a little bit for a couple of years, and then up a little more for a few more years, and then up a little more, and our body gets used to the feeling of glucose rising ever so slowly in the blood, so that we might think we're feeling okay, but we're really not. This is why I call type 2 diabetes the sneaky disease. So what can you do to lower your risk of developing diabetes? Exercise. Kids your age are supposed to get an hour's worth of exercise a day. When was the last time you worked up a good sweat? Don't be afraid to get out there and move. Keep your weight normal. Now, you don't have to be overweight to develop diabetes, but being overweight does increase your risk of type 2 diabetes. If you weigh more than you think you should, talk to an adult about it. And eat a healthy, well-balanced diet. The food groups include grains, vegetables, fruits, meat and beans, oils, and milk. Did you notice there's no soft drink group? Oh man, did, did you, you know notice there's, there's no, no candy group? That's because we're supposed to have those types of items sparingly. On special occasions, there is sometimes food. So the next time you're at a restaurant, instead of ordering a soft drink, I challenge you to say, Yes, I'd like a glass of milk, please. And I'll have a glass of water, please. See? Wasn't that easy? Oh, and I'll take an iced tea, please. Remember to eat plenty of fiber. And watch out for those fats. And don't eat more carbohydrates than you're using. Remember to eat a well-balanced meal. Here's an example of two different types of meals we could choose. The first meal, a cheeseburger, which is two carbohydrate servings, fries, four carb servings, a regular soft drink, five and a half servings, and a strawberry milkshake, which is six and a half carb servings. It has almost two entire days worth of carbs in it for me. It's low in fiber and high in sugar and fat. Whereas this meal, a cheeseburger, two carbohydrate servings, a salad, zero servings, an apple, one carb serving, and a glass of water, zero carb servings, has only about three servings of carbs in it, and it offers fiber and nutrients that keep me healthy. Notice all the colorful fruits and vegetables? Be sure you're eating a colorful variety of fruits and vegetables every day. 
So what you're saying, Debbie, is that you just want us to live healthy. Exercise, eat right, and keep your weight normal. Yeah, it's not like you're asking us to become a brain surgeon. Or fly to the moon. Roger that, Joe. You're cleared for liftoff. That's right, guys. All you have to do is make a few simple changes in order to make a huge difference. The power is within you. Yeah.